Hello and welcome to Commodity Champions, your weekly dose of what's brewing in the commodity space. I'm Anisha Gupta and here's a quick roundup of the year so far. According to Bank of America Merrill Lynch, supply demand forecast suggests that the crude oil market is expected to witness a deficit of 1.6 million barrels per day in this year. Meanwhile, crude production is expected to rebound this year by 6.3 million barrels after it fell by 9 million barrels per day in the previous year. Precious metal prices also are lower this year to date as gold is down 5% but it did recover on Friday from more than a two-month lows hit on Thursday's session. Silver is down half a percent in this week and among the base metal prices, both copper and metals have fallen year to date by over a percentage each while nickel and lead are up more than 7%. To discuss what happened in the week gone by and what are the expectations now going forward for 2021, we are joined by Edward Morse. He's Global Head of Commodities Research at Citigroup. Edward, hi. Let's start with the volatility that we've seen in silver prices and that clearly has been the talking point in this this week, the short squeeze that has been played. How do you see that changing it on the charts? Is it a flash in the pan? How do you look at the volatility and the fundamentals describing silver now? We see the trade as uh, people who were inspired by what was happening in some of the equity markets looking at, uh, at the silver market and pushed the price up uh, above 30. Uh, the problem was that they were looking at a model in which the market was essentially short and they were applying it to the silver market, which was really essentially long to begin with. So it encouraged people who were long silver, who were expecting the silver gold ratio to continue to contract in favor of silver uh, to go, uh, go ahead and buy more silver. But it looks as though that episode is over and, uh, and now we, we're looking more uh, at the fundamentals and silver still is a positive picture for us. So, Ed, how would you look at silver then for this year? Because the estimates of industrial application on silver are on the rise. We've seen the mine supply continue to decline. The consumption numbers are looking very good. How do you look at the supply demand dynamics and what are your targets for silver for this year? So we're looking at, yes, uh, another rise in demand. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, we think the supply side is going to be ample, but we're looking at, uh, at silver prices that, uh, still where it's pricing today, uh, have a little way to go up. So uh, we think civil will remain in the, in the high 20s and will from time to time uh, hit $30 as it did last week. So Ed, you do not see the silver prices sustaining or keeping above $30 per ounce in all of 2021? No, we, we had thought and spoke about it that at the beginning when we saw the move in silver, we thought it was quite temporary. Uh, we thought there was no underlying play uh, with a short positioning of people having to cover their position uh, and have the price go up. And, uh, and we see you know, a, a fairly robust market. It's not just on the solar panel side, uh, but as you know from your own country and, uh, and from China as well, uh, after a couple of years in which jewelry demand was fairly low, uh, jewelry demand is, is, is rising again. So that should put another uh, underlying supportive factor uh, under the silver price to stay in the high 20s, maybe hit 30 from time to time for the next couple of years. All right. Ed, I remember when we've had conversations earlier, you have been bullish on copper. What is your sense on that in sense of price view? And what about the other metals like iron, steel, nickel, platinum? Do you see the green industry, green energy theme playing for many of these? So we're 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 uh, we're bullish depending on the metal. We're certainly bullish platinum and palladium. Uh, we uh, we are bullish nickel. We're not so bullish aluminum, uh, but those are all plays on on the demand side for uh, for metals that are uh, uh, have been underinvested in in terms of uh, supply going forward. So you bullish a lot of metals there. You said platinum, palladium, nickel and copper and aluminum as well. But what about gold? Because, you know, the kind of run up that we've seen in various asset classes, would you say that in some sense gold has been left behind? And what are the support and the resistance levels that you see in this one? Uh, we, we think that at the bottom it's more or less at the support level. Uh, and 
It could be triggered by uh, any of a number of events that uh, are potentially foreseeable. So risk on is certainly um, in the world um, and a weakness on, uh, on, uh, on earning from, uh, from interest rates is certainly the driver that we, sit, we think will, will push it back up more than anything else. And I want to shift gears and talk about the crude oil prices because that has been the best performing commodity until now and this year up by nearly 18% and we've seen uh, one year highs come in for the crude oil prices. Where do you see the demand coming in from? Is it the strong data or is it more about sentiment even now or is it just about lack of any bearish development? We are uh, euphoric about oil this year. We think uh, that uh, our Full case is unfolding rather than our base case. We're already close to uh, pricing where we had expected it in our base case of Brent uh, uh, averaging 59 uh, by the last quarter of the year, certainly hitting over 60 from time to time. We think we're seeing that base case accelerating. It's unfolding more rapidly than we thought in our bull case uh, is one that sees Brent in the mid-60s by uh, the end of the year and uh, we think that's more likely than than the likelihood of the price going down we see it in the inventory levels wherever we can measure them oil and in, uh, in transit at sea uh, is lower than it was a year ago uh, uh, lower than it was uh, 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 in july and august uh, we see uh, oil and float uh, really having come down to normalized levels uh, the decline has been in crude not so much in products, but we think that product uh, decline will start up before the end of, uh, of the first quarter around the world, and uh, that will boost refining margins and refinery demand for crude oil at the same time. I hmm. absolutely can't let you go without talking about soft commodities. You closely track them and we've seen multi-year highs in many of them, whether it's corn, soybean, sugar or wheat. What are your top picks here for this year? Yeah, so uh, we're with you on where those prices have gone up. We remain bullish yet for the rest of the year uh, on corn and soybeans, uh, on ethanol, and we're more neutral. Uh, the other softs like sugar, cocoa, coffee, um, and even uh, the other row crop wheat. But yes, we definitely see uh, a combination of factors at work. Uh, the Latin American yield of soybeans was not as robust as had been anticipated. Uh, partially due to weather. Uh, the uh, U.S. yields are up, but Chinese demand is remarkably high, uh, both for beans and for corn. Uh, it's high for uh, two reasons, replenishing of the, uh, of the hog herd, herds that have been depleted because of swine fever, um, and the Chinese government decision uh, to boost stocks which it took in the last party Congress. Uh, it took uh, a decision to boost, uh, uh, boost inventory storage for everything, but most particularly uh, for the, the, the row crops that we've just been talking about. So we think that uh, underlying demand will be higher than normal uh, and there will be some supply problems uh, uh, going into the first half of the year. We'll see what happens with yield out of the US uh, and some other countries like uh, like Canada and uh, Ukraine uh, toward the end of the year. But in the meanwhile, uh, we are bullish uh, those two row crops. All right, bullish on soft commodities, bullish on metals like copper, nickel, platinum as well. And crude prices could go to mid $65 as well. And thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure talking to you. But with that, we'll go for a short break. But don't go anywhere. We continue to discuss the best commodity bets for the upcoming year in conversation with Francisco Blanche, head of global commodities at Bank of America, ML. Welcome back. You're watching Commodity Champions and joining us now is Francisco Blanche, Head of Global Commodities and Derivatives Research, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Francisco, good to have you. I was just talking to Edward Moores from City, and he thinks that crude prices can hit mid-60s by end of 2021. What is your sense with the kind of run-up that we've seen in crude oil prices? Do you see an equal amount of bullishness there? We've had a $60 barrel Brent target uh, since June of last year, 
for the second quarter. And uh, you might say, okay, Francisco, so we are pretty close to 60. Um, so you're close to your target. Um, do you see further upside? And, and the answer is yes, probably there is some further upside and we've talked about those risks. However, I would say that inventories are still very high. And also I would say that remember, part of the reason why we are ahead of the, of the curve, why we, oil prices are higher than we expected is because OPEC extended their production cuts uh, of the uh, of, of a prior year into the first quarter of this year. And then Saudi Arabia in the first month of the year, uh, in January, early January, decided to take out an extra million barrels a day in February and March. So we have eight plus million barrels a day of oil offline being held back by OPEC plus. And then of course, we also have almost 2 million barrels a day of Iranian oil that is offline because of sanctions. And that's a lot of oil. It's 10 million barrels a day in a 100 million barrel a day market, which means that as prices go up, there's gonna be a temptation to release some of this oil into the global economy. So I, I do think there's upside to our target, but I also think there's so much spare capacity that we are likely gonna be in a capped oil price environment until, until uh, the vaccination campaigns prove to be truly effective within the next um, three to six months. And, and, by, and, and by the way, it has to be around the world. Um, so so that's, that's my thinking. Initially capped, but eventually maybe some more upside down the line. All right. I want to move on to silver now, and that clearly has been the talk of the town for this week. What is your sense on the charts after this recent short squeeze, and how are you looking at the forecast for 2021? So we, we've uh, had a $50 an ounce target for silver for quite some time. Um, and, and the reason is simple. Silver is key to decarbonization efforts because silver is a key ingredient into solar panels. And as a result, we see um, the deployment of solar panels around the world pushing up the demand for silver over the next few years. So that's, that's the main view. Um, now remember, silver is coming from a, from a dark past. Uh, for a long time, silver's main industrial use was in photography. And then over time, when we all moved to our uh, handheld devices, our phones, right? Uh, essentially, we, uh, we saw a big decline in the demand for silver. But now this is all coming back with solar panels. And we think that, uh, again, put the effort by China, the effort by Europe, and, and importantly, what's happening in the US where the Biden administration is going to be pushing for a big environmental agenda, will support uh, any metal that is linked to decarbonization, and silver is one of those metals. Now, whatever is happening on the retail front with all this Reddit story and Wall Street bets, I don't think that's very relevant. The silver market is very big. It's not GameStop. It's not AMC. This is a very, very large market that cannot be cornered easily by a group of retail investors, in my opinion. Um, but again, I mean, we've seen weirder things. That's, you, you can move prices up by, by a little bit, but Wall Street's been generally long silver. Uh, retail money is not big enough to impact silver, in my opinion, or at least not impact it on a sustained basis. You can impact it for a couple of days. But uh, again, we remain bullish and, and the fundamental story is clear. It's all driven by increased demand for solar panels. All right. So what's your view on gold going forward? You've been bullish on this one as well. You've had higher targets on gold. How are you looking at for 2021? So as, as you may know, we were one of the most bullish, probably the most bullish house on, on Wall Street on gold uh, back in April of last year when we started to see governments come in with massive fiscal and monetary stimulus programs, which is what I discussed earlier. But we've, we've recently changed our tone on gold. Back in November, uh, mid-November, we changed our view and said, well, you know, we're going to take out our target uh, of 3,000 because we think that um, interest rates are likely to start going up. We think cyclical commodities are likely to start pushing higher. And ultimately, uh, dollar weakness may not be enough to push gold uh, structurally to that $3,000 level for now. So, We've maintained a $2,000 gold number uh, for this year, and we still think we're not bearish gold because there's so much going on on the monetary and fiscal space that it's really hard to be out of gold uh, because any mistake on fiscal or monetary could end up pushing gold prices all higher. But I do think it's important to understand that the upside potential for gold comes from real rates going very negative. 
And today, what we are seeing is 10-year U.S. Treasuries are going up. Our team thinks they'll go up another 50 basis points from here, at least, into year end. And, and for me, that's a big headwind for gold. And also, as we are starting to see, it's, it's kind of positive for the dollar, too, particularly euro dollar, which is the main cross that matters for gold. And, and, and again, that strength in the dollar versus the euro is, is unlikely to help gold prices either. So I don't see a lot of downside because I think ultimately uh, we've injected so much money in the economy that people are not going to be willing to sell their gold, which they view as their, their kind of base money, their protection. But equally, uh, for, for gold to go meaningfully higher, we need those real interest rates to really go very negative again. And, and instead of that, we are seeing nominal rates going higher. And that's the bottom line for gold. So a little upside, not much. Okay. So, uh, Francisco, you are more bullish on silver than gold then? Absolutely. We are more bullish on silver because of the decarbonization issues. Because we think ultimately silver has an industrial use that is required for the next decade to meet the Paris Agreement targets uh, when it comes to bringing down CO2 emissions. And that's the, that's the bottom line for silver. It is a metal that is very important in future technologies, what we call a MIFT. And MIFTs are really what you want to own in this environment. You want to own those MIFTs. You want to own silver, you want to own copper, you want to own nickel, you want to own uh, metals that, uh, cobalt, metals that are important in this transition to a greener economy that's going on around the world. Oh, you've named a lot of metals there, precious and industrial metals. So while 2020 did see a phenomenal rally in many of these base metal prices, especially from those March and April lows, any metal where you see stronger fundamentals, how would you rank it really? Well, uh, as I mentioned, I think you got to stay on the industrial metals that are linked to decarbonization. To me, the most obvious contender here is copper. Even though nickel is done really well, we think nickel is a little bit uh, overbought. Uh, because prices have uh, rallied above fundamentals. Uh, there is uh, a surplus in the market for this year in our estimates, and we see a surplus building up for the next couple of years on nickel specifically, which is used mostly in stainless steel applications and battery technology. But very importantly, on copper, copper is so key to this whole thing, right? Because copper is used across the decarbonization of transportation, the decarbonization of electricity networks, the decarbonization of industry. Whatever you look at, batteries, uh, transmission lines, uh, power, uh, related infrastructure, it all goes through copper. And on top of this, I should mention, copper is one of the commodities that's been most negatively impacted on the supply side because of COVID. And you know why? Well, because most of copper in the world, most copper in the world is produced where? In Latin America. What is going on in Latin America? You have the worst COVID pandemic in the world. Right? Mexico all the way down to Chile, worst pandemic in the world, right? Latin America is terrible. So what's happening there is that we've had mine shutdowns because remember, COVID is not a very mine friendly disease. You have to go down into the mine. There's no ventilation, right? It's the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be in open spaces. In copper mines, you're going down 500 meters, 1,000 meters. And all of that is basically a closed space without ventilation, very dangerous for COVID transmission, and we saw those mines shutting down. So supply was negatively impacted, and demand is charging forward. Remember, those fiscal programs we've seen around the world have made governments a lot bigger, which means that today, governments have much greater involvement in the economy and are going to target the resources to achieve those Paris Agreement goals. The next leg up in growth is through decarbonization, through the energy transition. And this is where copper, I think, plays more more important role than any other industrial metal, in my opinion. All right, taken that point. Uh, you know, Francisco, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, clearly is bullish on commodities, and many of them, and you've given us targets for 2021 also. But if you were to stack your portfolio, how would you put these commodities in order then? Well, so, I mean, I think... Uh, I think you can take from my comments. Um, I, I like industrial metals generally quite a bit from here. Um, I think they, they stand out the most. Uh, and within the industrial metals, I like uh, copper. And I like uh, I also like nickel, although at this level, it's a little rich. Um, and I, I like cobalt. Um, and, and I think even aluminum might do OK in this environment. 
Uh, I also like carbon. We didn't talk about carbon, but I really like carbon, CO2 emissions. I think that's a commodity that has a long way to go, even though we've already rallied a lot. Um, and then I think oil is coming back. I think oil is coming back. Um, and natural gas, uh, I think, is, is also going to have, U.S. natural gas specifically, is going to have a, a good run. Um, and then, then, of course, I'll probably put silver next to copper uh, in terms of our, our bullish constructs. So probably silver and copper uh, among the top picks. And then I, after all these commodities, I probably put gold towards the bottom. We think gold will underperform in this rally. All right. Well, uh, many commodities where uh, Bank of America is bullish, but not so much on the cryptocurrencies, as Francisco mentioned. Thank you so much, Francisco, for joining us and giving us those ideas for 2021. But with that, it's a wrap up on this edition of Commodity Champions. Thank you for watching.